the title of my sermon is Dangers from Within. So before I continue, so let's all read from Jude verse 10 to verse 13. Yet these men speak abusively against whatever they do not understand. And what things they do understand by instinct like unreasoning animals. These are the very things that destroy them. Verse 11. Woe to them, Jude said. They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error. They have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. Verse 12. These men are blemishes at your love feasts, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, and uprooted, twice dead. They are wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved forever. Woe! Strong words. Dangers from within. Let me first of all tell you a true story from World War II. It was the Battle of the Bulge. It was Hitler's last stand. After the Allied forces had landed in Normandy, they were pushing the German forces backwards throughout Europe. And so Hitler decided to have a counter-offensive suddenly, secretively, without letting anyone know, only his top commanders. They initiated what is called the Battle of the Bulge, or the Ardennes counter-offensive. It really took the Allied forces by surprise. But one of his strategy of this, Hitler's strategy was this. He infiltrated into the Allied rank and file German soldiers disguised as American soldiers. So he trained them, made them talk American, you know what I mean? And uh, so that these German soldiers could wreak havoc among the rank and file of the Americans, for example, uh, showing them the wrong direction in roadblocks. The whole scheme failed. Very quickly, the disguised German soldiers were discovered. But what it did was that as they infiltrated the rank and file of the American army, it sowed paranoia. It sowed distrust, suspicion among the Americans. So why? Because they don't know whether this guy is actually American or German. Ma. So much so that uh, a major general, Bruce Clark, was arrested by the military police because he could not answer correctly a question about the Chicago Cubs. He doesn't know about anything of the Chicago Cubs. So the military police thought that this was a German disguised as American general. It's funny, right? But it's exactly what Jude is warning us. In his epistle, he said that there are godless men, men whose condemnation was written about long ago, they have secretly slipped in among you. So, so Jude is now, I'm going to sh I show you some pictures of these so-called Germans who are disguised as Americans at a, at a firing squad. They're going to be shot because they were discovered. So Jude is sharing with us the same danger, like the Battle of the Bulge. Men have now come into your ranks to wreak havoc from within in the end time church. And he does it in two ways. First of all, 
Jude gave three Old Testament examples and then he goes on to describe five natural metaphors to illustrate again and again this danger from within. You see, if a danger is from without, you can identify it. Ma. But when the danger is from inside, oh, very hard to know. Why? Because you can't distinguish which one is on your side, right? Like the Battle of the Bulge, and which one is on the enemy's side. And finally, I want to share with you how do we overcome? Very interestingly, Jude used the word contend. Contend for your faith. That's in verse 3. I felt I had to write and urge you to contend for the faith. Contend, he used the word in Greek, ek agonizomai. Ek agonizomai. From where the English word agonize come from. So, so Jude is agonizing. He's in pain. Why? Because he knows that if he does not resolve this issue, warn the church, it could destroy the church. And that's why, my friend, what I'm going to share with you today is very very important because it is also happening in the end time church. Dangers from within. So first of all, Jude goes on to talk about three Old Testament examples to illustrate what are these dangers from within. It is in verse 11. Let me read again. Woe to them! They have taken the way of Cain. They have rushed for profit into Balaam's error and they have been destroyed in Korah's rebellion. The three Old Testament examples are number one, the way of Cain. Number two, I call it the wages of Balaam. And number three, I call it the waywardness of Korah. It's very interesting that uh, these three examples, right, is one of the distinctives of, of Jude in his epistle. Interesting, uh, we didn't mention it before so far, but I want to mention it now, that he writes in trees, triads. That's his style, you see. So, so uh, for example, uh, in Jude verse uh, 1, to those who have been called, one, who are loved by God, kept by Jesus Christ, Triad, trees. Verse 2, mercy, peace, and love, three. So, so he, he goes in triads. For example, at the first tranche about the carnality of the church, he talks about uh, the, the, the children of Israel. He talks about the rebellious angels. He talks about Sodom and Gomorrah, again three. So again, this is three or triad. So one of the distinctive of Jude is that he goes by triads. You know, in olden days, uh, not now, uh, I don't know whether now or so or not, uh, triad uh, is a term used to describe Chinese secret society. They are triads, right? So all these triads are shadowy, they are secretive, they are underground, and they are what I call surreptitious, meaning that they are secretive. Same here. All these examples that Jude gave to illustrate people within the church who are shadowy, secretive, underground, surreptitious to wreak havoc in the end time church. That's why I say to you, hear me, hear me very well, my friend, in this morning's message. What is the way of Cain? I can't go to detail, all right, but I just give you the reference, Genesis chapter 4. We know that Cain was one of the two sons of Adam and Eve. The other was Abel. Abel gave offering of animals to God. Cain gave offering of the produce of the land. But that's not right because 
I'm very sure Adam would have told Cain and Abel, hey, God only receives offerings of animals. Huh? But Cain didn't care. He just did what he think was right in his own eyes. So he was angry as well when he was told, hey, don't do that. So God said to Cain, Cain, why are you angry? Oh? Why? Uh, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you don't do what is right, hey, be careful. Uh, sin is crouching at your door. Genesis chapter 4, verse 6 to verse 7. So what is the way of Cain? The way of Cain is the decision to do what you think is right and not what God thinks is right. My way is the right way. So I do what I like because that my way is the right way. Don't do what is right may not always be your way, but do what is right in God's way and God's will. Anger was only a symptom. There was an underlying defect. And what was it? Defiance. Defiance. I don't care what God says. And if you tell me, I cannot do it, I'm angry. Look, uh, am I speaking to anybody out there who's angry? What are you angry about? Oh? Don't know. Some of you don't even know what you're angry about, right? Angry lah, just angry lah. Why? Because my way is not accepted. Ma. The way of Cain. Be very careful. The way of Cain is defiance. But what is the wages of Balaam? Interestingly, he talks about the wages of Balaam's error. Well, again, I, I won't have time to, 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 to look into it in detail, but this is referenced in Numbers chapter 22, 25. So actually, four chapters you know, in Numbers uh, on Balaam, 22, 23, 24, 25. Uh, it's a lot of material there. But what happened? Who is Balaam? Well, Balaam actually was a prophet of God. He actually was a godly man, you know. Why? Because God speaks to him. God converse with him. But no, hey, how many of us are God speaks to us directly? I don't know. I don't know. About, I don't know. But clearly, Balaam is not nobody, but an authentic, genuine prophet of God whom God speaks to. But what happened to him? If the problem is a symptom of Cain was anger, which covered an underlying issue of defiance, then the error of Balaam, the symptom of Balaam was avarice. Pastor was avarice. Well. Some of you told me, hey, Pastor, you know, when you did overview of Judah, you said avarice. Uh, I, I learned a new word. It's greed, la, just greedy. La. All right. So, so, so Balaam was avaricious. He was greedy. But wait a minute. You are a prophet of God, right? God, don't you think God will supply your needs? Hey, you are a servant of God, ma. Don't you think God, he has enough and to spare? Of course. But no. I want more. I want more. More and more. So, the underlying issue of Balaam was a deficit mentality. If the underlying issue of Cain was defiance, the underlying issue of Balaam, the wages of Balaam, is a deficit mentality. Now, what is a deficit mentality? I define it this way. A deficit mentality is when you always think that you do not have enough, even though actually you got enough and to spare. Avaricious, ma. 
I do not have enough. I want more. I want more and more and more. So you will never have enough because enough is not enough for you. You have what I call a deficit mentality. And you look at people and you are always jealous of other people and more than you want. You even are jealous of Bill Gates. Serious? Yeah, I got people who are really jealous, jealous of Bill Gates. Hey, please. Uh. You know what Paul tells us in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6? Godliness with contentment is great gain. Godliness with contentment uh, is not only gain, you know, but great gain. Believe me, you will have a rested spirit if you do not have the wages of Balaam. So the way of Cain is a way of defiance. I do what I think is right. The wages of Balaam is having a deficit mentality, never enough one. What is the waywardness of Korah? It talks about Korah. It is non-submission to authority. It is descent to God-given authority. If I may add a term, you fester and you foster a coup d'etat against God-given authority. This is the waywardness of Korah. I'm going to spend a little bit more time here because it's a very serious problem. The Bible reference is Numbers chapter 16. When in verse 1 it says in the NIV, Korah and certain Reubenites became insolent and rose up against Moses. What is insolent? Insolence is rude behavior that does not show respect. You are rude. But pastor, I don't respect that leader, ma. I don't respect that senior pastor, ma. I don't respect him, ma. Hey, there is a divine order in God's kingdom. If that pastor is wrong, whatever it is, God will deal with him. Anna. God will deal with him. Anna. So, can I say this? I know it doesn't happen in SIBKL. We are a wonderful church, you know. SIBKL is such a wonderful, wonderful church. That's why, for me, I, I, I'm very sure I speak on behalf of all my other pastors. It's our pleasure and our privilege to pastor you, honestly. But it's not the same uh, for other churches. Believe me, believe me. A lot of churches are uh, not like that one, no. A lot of split div division, a lot of, of quarrels, you know what I mean? A lot of issues one, uh, 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 against the leadership and they split and split and split and split again one, no. And, and oh no, and, and, and even as I speak, I, 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 I know it, I know it, believe me. I'm, I can't tell you the details, but I'm very closely connected with a, with, with a spiritual organization that right at the very moment, the top leadership is experiencing rebellion. And I feel so sorry, still so sorry for the top leadership. There's a group of people that, that, that wants to bring the leader down. Scandalizing. Half-truth. This is the waywardness of Korah. And I want to say this to you, my friend. God, take it very seriously. What happened to Korah? Do you know the, the earth opened up and swallowed this guy? together with his uh, 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 core leaders, with ring leaders, 
And then after that, 250 of his family members and all his other followers barbecued uh, from, by fire from heaven uh, in front of the children of Israel. What he tells me is this. This is a very serious danger. And God views it very, very seriously. Hear me and hear me well. Praise God, as I said, this is not present in SIBKL and I'm very, very thankful and very grateful to God because there's such a wonderful spirit in our church. Really, really, really. Praise God. Huh? We thank God for SIBKL. Huh? And, and, and let's pray that all of these three Old Testament examples of dangers within defiance, a deficit mentality. You, you know, Balaam was, was, was paid to curse Israel, you know. Can you imagine that? He was paid to curse Israel. But every time he opened his mouth, uh, the curses became a blessing. Why? Because God protects his people. Ma. Don't you think so? God protects his own one. Ma. So in fact, on the, on the third or fourth time, Balaam became very prophetic some more. He prophesied about the coming of the Messiah. Wow. God protects one. Don't give in to non-submission to God-given authority because God used it very seriously. So, three Old Testament examples and now five illustrations taken from nature to describe some more these dangers from within the church. And let me read now Jude verse 12 to verse 13. These men are blemishes at your love feast, eating with you without the slightest qualm, shepherds who feed only themselves. They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, and uprooted twice dead. Verse 13. They are like wild waves of the sea, foaming up their shame, wandering stars for whom blackest darkness has been reserved for ever. Before I share with you these five natural metaphors or analogies taken from nature, let me go back to verse uh, 10. Very interestingly, the three Old Testament examples and the five natural metaphors are predicated on the description of these men in verse 10. When Jude talks about these people don't understand what they're talking about. They only understand by instincts. They are unreasoning animals. Wow, serious or not? Jude compares to these people in the strongest of terms. They act instinctively. They are like unreasoning animals. In other words, they are carnal. And, and let me say this to all of us so that we are warned. Don't have no spiritual insights, no wisdom, no discernment. Talk, 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 talk only. So, so say, Jun said, you got no understanding. You are an unreasoning animal. So can I say this? And I say this lovingly to all of us. There is nothing more dangerous than a carnal man pretending to be spiritual and professing to hear from God when actually he hasn't. Very dangerous. Bahayo, sangat bahayo. There is nothing more dangerous in the church than a carnal-minded man 
pretending to be spiritual, thus saith the Lord. The Lord spoke to me, you know. I know how many times people say to me, Hey, Pastor, God said, Sure or not? And professing to hear from God, when in fact, he has never heard from God. Hear me, hear me well, my friend. Don't be like that. So what are the five natural metaphors that now Jude goes on to elaborate and describe this dangerous man? He used five metaphors. Number one, hidden reefs. Number two, cloud, rainless clouds. Number three, fruitless trees. Number four, raging waves. And number five, shooting stars. Wow, serious. I thought these are awesome, awesome uh, 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 words, you know. And, and, and I, I, let, let me go down one by one very, very quickly. Very, very quickly. Very interestingly, the first one he describes as hidden reefs in verse 12. But actually, the amazing thing is this. And I find this very, very interesting. It's not mentioned in NIV. Huh? So if I look at all the different versions of the Bible, Every, almost every version interprets and translates this verse differently. Even, no? But I like what the uh, NLT and the NASB translation uh, of this. Uh, NIV talks about shepherds uh, uh, feed only themselves. But the NLT and NA, NSAB translation of verse 12 is this. They are like dangerous hidden reefs that can shipwreck you. Whoa! So, they mentioned hidden reefs. So, so, why are hidden reefs dangerous? Because you can't see them, right? They are underwater, ma. all right? So, the ship comes, bang! That's why they're lighthouses, right? Why, why, why are they lighthouses? To warn the ships, hey, don't go near there. There are dangerous rocks underneath the water. So, hidden reefs. Very dangerous, oh, because they are under the water, invisible to the naked eye. Rainless clouds. It's an oxymoron, right? <sighs> clouds got rain, one ma. What are clouds made of? Water. And yet, no. So in Chinese we say, "Ho tai mo sick ah." You cannot deliver. I look at the cloud. Hey, rain is coming. Look, when Jude wrote this epistle to Israel, Israel was an agricultural economy. They depend on rain. No rain, no harvest. Tiada hasil, right? If there is no rain, there's a lot of clouds. What for? They don't want clouds. They want rain. No fruit. In other words, fruitless Christians. Talk about fruitless trees next, right? So people like that talk a lot, but actually at the end, they do not deliver one. Fruitless trees. You know, Jesus is very angry with people who are fruitless. One, no? You remember he cursed the fig tree? No fruit. Small, small, unripe figs, good enough. La. Only leaves. Curse it. But what I want to ask myself as I look at this verse in verse 12, he says, They are clouds without rain, blown along by the wind, autumn trees without fruit, uprooted, twice dead. Why twice dead? Huh? Aiyya! So I thought, I thought, I thought, how to explain to my church uh, why twice dead? Huh? And then I called, came across the autumn. No, you know in autumn the leaves fall, right? And then winter comes and then all leaves fall. All you see is a tree with no leaves, only branches, looks dead on the outside. And then spring comes. The leaves blossom, uh, the, the, the flowers come out, and then come spring and winter uh, and summer, fruit comes out. But these trees, uh, not only are they dead on the outside, but come spring, no fruits. No leaves. Why? Because they are also dead on the inside. Absolutely right. They are dead on the outside. They are also dead on the inside. 
twice dead. Not productive in their life. No fruit to show. There are also raging waves. Wow, I find this very exciting because my, my mind, my imagination run wild, you know. These are waves. These are raging waves. And, and a picture I have is, a walk, you know, walking along Port Dixon or in uh, Penang. Those of you who live there will know what I'm talking about. And those of us who love to see, oh, if I can go to the sea again, I, oh, I can travel interstate. You know, you hear the waves. Sha, sha. And you look at the waves, a lot of foam. Huh? But actually, useless one. Useless. They don't achieve any purpose one. All right? So all they go is a lot of foam. Wild waves. Raging waves. In fact, they cause damage. Do you think so? Look what's happening to the Hurricane Ida. Whoa! The waves come and it cause damage. A lot of damage. But actually, at the end of the day, the picture I have is that a lot of sound and fury. You, you know, um, I love of all of Shakespeare's books, Macbeth. Why? Because when I was doing my senior Cambridge uh, uh, O-Levels, uh, last time I was senior Cambridge O-Levels, not, 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 what call it? SPM, that's right, not, not SPM. Um, we studied English literature. So we studied, we, during my time, we studied Macbeth. So I know Macbeth quite well. And, and there is this uh, 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 famous speech by Macbeth in Act 5, Scene 5, when he says, at the end of Macbeth's life, the way to dusty death, out, out, brief candle, a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. Don't throw stones at me, huh? Yes. Shakespeare that calls people idiot, not Pastor Chu. Huh? Full of sound and fury. Raging waves. Actually, all that they do is to bring trash and debris to litter the seashore. Don't be like that. Finally, shooting stars. Shooting stars, stars that, 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 that shoot and after that disappear. You know, I, I told my, my, my staff recently in Refresh, don't be a fireworks Christian. Uh. Don't be a, a, a firecracker Christian. Uh. And I showed them in Staff Refresh uh, a few seconds or 10 to 20 seconds of the closing ceremony of the Tokyo Olympic Games. You know, went round and round and round and round, round the, 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 the stadium. And after that, just smoke. Fireworks, Christian. Shooting stars. After a while, again, nothing. Nothing to show. La. You know, in SIBKL, we always say, fly high, last long. Amen? Hallelujah. We don't want to fly high and crash, right? We want to fly high, last long. Okay, come on, church. Wherever you are, in the living room or in the bedroom or wherever it is, come, do it with me. Do this action. Fly high, last long. Come on, everybody, children as well. Are you ready? Are you ready? Follow after me, say, and do this action. Now, fly high, last long, all right? Are you ready? One, two, three. Fly high, last long. One more time. Fly high, last long. One more time. Fly high, last long. Yeah! We want to fly high, last long. We don't want to be shooting stars. Let me close. I'm going to close by sharing with you just five ways to overcome from verse 20 to 23. And I'm going to take only two or three minutes to do it. Why? Because you're going to hear more of it in two weeks' time from Pastor Isaac and Pastor Lee Chu. All right? Uh, and I don't want to steal their thunder. Huh? So I don't want to steal their thunder. So I'm just mentioning it. How do we overcome five ways? Verse 20 to verse 23. Jude says, first of all, build yourself up in your most holy faith. How? Word and prayer. 
That's why in the 40 days of fast and prayer, we're coming to a close now. I don't know about you, but my faith is built up. My spirit man is built up. And then you pray in the Holy Spirit. I was praying in tongues. And I do that every morning. I do that every morning. I build up my spirit man. I think it's uh, 1 Corinthians 14, 14. You see, when we pray in tongues, we edify ourselves. So I build up my spirit man by praying in the Holy Spirit or praying in tongues. Keep yourselves in the God's love. And it is an active word. Keep. It is proactive. Oh, no, I, I bask in the love of God. It's true. But you have to abide. You have to intentionally want to keep yourself in the love of God. Like an umbrella, law. you know, you, 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 you put up the umbrella ma, when it rains ma, and you deliberately shelter yourself under the umbrella of God's love. Ma. And then verse 4 and 5 is very important. More so at this time now. How do we overcome when we show mercy to other people, when we snatch others from the fire? And more than any other time, and with this I'll close, at this time of, in Malaysia, we need to help other people. There are people who are worse off than us. Don't you think so? There are people who are struggling, the weak. Come on, show mercy to them. Show love to them. Show concern to them. Snatch them out from the fire. Many of them want to, are, are, are anxious, they're depressed. We need to counsel them, give them hope. And I'm very proud of SIBK. I'm telling you, I'm so proud of you, La Church. I'm so glad I'm your senior pastor, man. I'm so proud, you know. I, I will never do anything more than this, you know. Because in our CIA program, 156, 160 cells are involved. We give you a seed money of 3K. But many of you go to the highways and the byways and, and you help the B40s and, and many of you not only give them food, but counsel them and, and a tremendous potential for evangelism. I, I know of one, one, one cell, I won't mention their name. Wow, I was so impressed with this cell. I'll mention the name, it's Walk Cell. You know, it was so good, you know. They, they, uh, the, 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 the cell ministered to 120 over families, you know, touching almost 600 lives, you know with food and, and whatever help they need. And, and, and not only that, besides the 3K, not counting the 3K, they themselves raised well over 20K themselves to continue helping. Outstanding, man. Outstanding. So I'm so proud of you guys at SIBKL. But let's continue to do that. Do that. Shall we do that? Let's continue to give hope, shall we? Let's continue to give hope and life to everyone outside there who are in need. And by doing this, we overcome the detractors. We overcome the naysayers. We overcome the negative people. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Father, I thank you this morning, even as we share this word. God, you enable us, even as we go through these difficult times, to run to you, not run away from you. Father, that we'll be strong, we'll be resilient, Father Lord, because even as a storm comes, Lord, we find shelter in you. Hallelujah. Father, we bless you for this word. Help us to take it seriously, Lord. Help us to take it seriously. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Can I say this to you, my friend? These are challenging days. These are days in which our faith is tested. These are days in which maybe even doubt set in. But can I encourage you, don't give up. Please don't give up. Be strong, be resilient. Be strong, be resilient. Hallelujah. Don't be tired of doing acts of kindness because more than any other time, the church needs to be relevant now to help the, the poor, to those who are depressed, to give them hope. Hallelujah. So that we are vigilant. We ourselves must be vigilant. We ourselves must be in what? Singaporeans call heightened alertness. Let's be ready. Let's be vigilant. Amen. Let's, let's, let's seek the face of God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, in Jesus' name, I want to pray and bless every person here. Those who are suffering, those who are down, God, help us never to lose heart. To lift our faith up, to look towards you, Father Lord. Look towards you, that even as the NECF team in this 40 days of fast and prayer, Psalm 46 verse 10, Be still 
and know that I am God. It is that I am, that I am the ever-present God that will never leave us nor forsake us. So Father, separate us now with your blessing. And so may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face always to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the good Lord always shine His face, turn His face towards you and give you and your family shalom. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen.